Hello everybody, this is Last Minute Movies. Today is a movie about this giant murder machine that was designed to be a weapon. That's made that, of iron. That is made of iron. Um, it's actually not. Wait, what the fuck is it made of? It can't be. Yeah, fucking no. It's some, some crazy alien shit. But my point yeah. is, uh, a, a, a weapon, uh, a creature that was designed to be a weapon that through the power of love and compassion uh, learns not to be a weapon and it's an awesome fucking movie and it's called fucking Iron J no I love this movie uh, mm -hmm. I watched it a super long time ago uh, when I was really young and then I kind of forgot about it, and then I watched it again, and then I was like, oh, that was, like, when I was a teenager, I was like, oh, that's really good. And then for the podcast, I had to watch it, I watched it twice again, I'm, and as a casual moviegoer, I used to be kind of, like, gloss over things that the movie puts in there that are really subtle, and just be like, oh, you know, giant robots, and, you know, the relationship, it's pretty cool, cool, cool dynamic, cool film, you know, good, good, mm -hmm. but, like, as a filmmaker now, I have to like notice the subtleties, and I understand the subtleties of what filmmakers do because I do the same thing. And like, oh my god, like this film is amazing. Like, it's, it's, it's the fun. message. It's, it's the message. The, the core. Yeah. Look, you can't go stomping around, and you can't come with me. My mom will wig out. <laughs> That's right. You Still know. not as good as Spider-Verse. <coughs> okay, it's hard to but, beat uh, that one. <laughs> but it's up there. It's like really fucking close. Like super close. It's it's an amazing yeah. film. Uh, so I gotta say that I also have a really strange way of looking at it now because just like being Russian and growing up on the other side of the spectrum that this film is all about, like you know the whole. Sputnik. Yeah, exactly. The Sputnik and the, the like, the Cold War era in general. The commentary that this film has uh, t towards that kind of belief system that existed back then. Um, watching it from the outsider perspective is just that much more fascinating. Just because, like, I'm not immediately associated with it, but I spent enough time in the U.S. to understand it fully. You know, the fear of nuclear ob obliteration is absolutely a thing that you know one can resonate with. <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you know, it's just it's a really interesting aesthetic, and for a film that was released in 1999, I think that actually captures that really nicely, and it dwells on it really nicely too. And like, I gotta say that one of the things that always stood out for me in that movie specifically is the way in which uh, aggression and fear go hand in hand, and you see so many scenes where. Uh, like, you know, for me, it's not even about the giant as much as it's about people in it and just like this American spirit of a combination yeah. of fear and aggression and this desire to destroy things that scare you and like Is dominate it? them and obliterate them. Over here of Sputnik. Yeah, it's the first satellite in space. Foreign satellite. Sure what it can do. I don't feel safe, Hogarth. Do you? What are you talking about? Who built it? The Russians? The Chinese? Martians? Canadians? It's yeah. very much a it's very much a political commentary. I was like, wow, this film is a lot more like political than like I think than I thought it was. Like, so to the people that are like, oh, why does everything have to be political and all that kind of stuff? Shit is political, and y'all don't even know. You know what I'm oh, saying? Oh yeah. So just like quit it with all that. Like, I'm sure half the stuff that you love is a political commentary of something. Because well, it ends up being of, one. Yeah, yeah, that's what us artists do. Like, that's what us filmmakers do. We emulate real life. Real life mm -hmm. struggles, real life problems, real life things. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's what we do. So everything, in a way, is kind of political, you know? Or yep. some sort of statement about life and the meaning of it. Absolutely. But also about mm -hmm. humans, you know, uh, how human behavior plays into all of that. But, um, yeah, so, you know, we have a lot of things to say about this film. But we're going to start with a good old plot recap. And yes. there is a we, we have a we have a mutual friend Ali and I who is absolutely obsessed with that film. You got to check out his shoulder tattoo of Iron Giant, and like you know that's part of the reason why. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah. So for this episode, we're gonna let John Costa take over for the plot recap. Hello, I am John Costa. I have an Iron Giant tattoo, which means. I have the foremost knowledge of the nine 
an iron, iron giant. So I'm here to explain the plot to, to Igor and Ollie real quick. We start off, there's an old man on a boat, choppy water at night. It's crazy. Uh, he's looking for a lighthouse. He thinks he finds the lighthouse and then he's, the, the lighthouse moves and the, there's two lights and they look like eyes. And the guy's like, oh god, I think it's it's a giant of some sort, maybe iron. And then the boat crashes, he gets scared, he washes the shore, yada yada. Next day we see a little white boy on a bike with a shoebox, driving down, riding down the road. It's idyllic coastal town. Uh, he arrives at a diner where his single mother works. And uh, in the shoebox, Hogarth Hughes, the name of the, the little boy on the bike, yeah, he brought a squirrel that he caught. So, and the squirrel gets loose in the diner, uh, it crawls into, uh, this guy's pants. He's like, not Jeff Goldblum. He's like, I don't know, he's like a scrap metal yard artist or whatever. Squirrel latches onto his genitals and, uh, he plays it off like he's, he's fine, but yeah. He, uh, he goes home and his mom works a night shift and he kind of stays in and watches black and white movies and like fucking fills up a Twinkie with whipped cream and just shoves it all down his gullet. Um, yeah, so he does that. And then there, the power goes out. There's, some, there's a shake. I don't know, something happens with the power. And he's like, huh. So he looks out the window, sees like a, a path leading into the woods and trees are broken and shit. So he's like, okay, I'm gonna go see what's up. He grabs his BB gun and puts on a helmet and he's like, I'm gonna go investigate because I can do this. And he goes, investigates, and he reaches this electrical power plant place and he's like, all right, coast, coast seems clear to me. And then out of nowhere, oh, an iron giant appears. Whoa. And it's like, whoa. And Hogarth's like, whoa. And Iron Giant's like, whoa. And then uh, it, the, the Iron Giant starts to kind of go after Hogarth a little bit. And he's like, boom, boom, boom. And then, uh, and then he gets tangled up the power lines. And the Iron Giant's like, whoa. And then Hogarth's like, oh, God, this Iron Giant can feel pain, even though he's iron. So, he, thankfully, there's a comically large switch that says on and off, and Hogarth just turns it off. And then Giant goes, burr, burr, and it falls. Giant's passed out. Hogarth drops a rock down his mouth. The metal clangs, wakes up. You see the, the giant has a dent on his head, and uh, Hogarth's like, oh, come home with me, and I'll, I'll, I'll keep you safe. And they become friends. And they talk, and uh, Hogarth, and... They start to get to know each other a little bit, and then a government agent named Kent Mansley with uh, red hair, he's like rectangle face like this, and uh, he comes and investigates, he's like, oh, I see these footsteps, they look like they could belong to an iron giant or something, and then he, uh, Kent Mansley goes back to his car and the, the, the giant seems to have taken a bite out of it, I, it's, it's weird, so, yeah, Kent Mansley's like, some shit's up, I'm gonna investigate. Uh, meanwhile, Hog Hogarth is becoming friends with the giant, they get close, they, uh, they, they go to a lake and they play and they jump in the water and drain the water, it's, they all, they all hang out and, and Hogarth's teaching the giant right from wrong, you choose to be, you are, you choose to be, you be a, a, a Tomo or a Superman, you choose. So, uh, yeah, and the Iron Giant learns English along the way a little bit, he is able to communicate with Hogarth. And then uh, Hogarth can't keep the giant in the backyard anymore, so he meets up with the guy who got his the squirrel latched onto his genitals in the beginning. Remember, uh, not Jeff Goldblum. Hogarth goes back to meet him, and he's like, "I got this iron giant. Can I hide him here?" And he's like, "I don't know. This is a little sketched out." And uh, but yeah, his, then he's like, "Sure, I'll keep the iron giant here." He makes little art projects with the giant. It's cute. Uh, and then Hogarth, they keep doing friendly shit. And then Kent Mansley gets a, a whiff of something. Because you remember the BB gun Hogarth took to the power plant? Yeah, uh, that broke while it was there and it's still at the plant. And Kent Mansley finds it and it's got Hogarth, half of Hogarth's name on it, but he doesn't really know the full name. And he meets the family and he's, he's like, oh shit, Hogarth uses the boy who knows the giant. Blah, blah, blah. And so, Ken Mansley actually moves into Hogarth's house, because they're renting a room out. And so now, Ken Mansley's just like low-key stalking Hogarth and just being weird. And uh, 
on one night during dinner, the Iron Giant's hand gets loose and he kind of crawls around the house and shit. Uh, comedy gold, whatever. Uh, yeah. And then Cat Mansley ends up drugging Hogarth and giving him a truth serum and making him tell him about the Iron Giant and stuff. And then Cat Mansley gets his evidence. He's like, okay, calling in the military. Military chief comes, like Cat Mansley's boss. He's like, there's an Iron Giant in there. And it turns, and the Iron Giant poses like he's an art piece, and he just sits still. And the chief of the military or whatever is like, Ah, Cam Mansley, you fucking dweeb. You're wrong. And then they leave. But then, yeah, he 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 uh, he turns into a gun. The the Iron Giant just straight up turns into a gun after a uh, after the military finally finds out that he exists. I don't know how the fuck. I haven't seen this movie in like four years, and I'm pretty sure I'm accurately describing the events as it goes along. He, Iron Giant gets found out, uh, the military comes and tries to get him, uh, the military ends up hurting Hogarth, and the Iron Giant sees that, and goes full Iron Giant, and goes, Rah! and Vin, you hear Vin, Di Vin Diesel growling, it's like half of his lines in this movie, he's just growling. So he growls, turns into a gun, hand cannons, bam bam bam. Uh, the town's fucked, and then Hogarth comes to, and he's like, I need to save the Iron Giant, he goes and confronts him, and uh, he's able to calm the giant down, but then Cat Mansley steals his chief's phone and is like, nuke the giant, nuke him! So then, they send out a nuke, it's in the upper atmosphere, the Iron Giant realizes it, and he's like, I gotta be Superman, I gotta, you know, I gotta save it, so he, he tells Hogarth, you stay, no following. And, and, uh, the Iron Giant, as he's shooting up in the space, Hogarth is just like, I love you. <laughs> and it's so corny, but it's fucking, it hurts so much. Because they got such a close bond. And the Giant goes up, nuke me, bang. Uh, Iron Giant seems to be dead. Uh, he's a good, a good Iron Giant. He sacrificed himself for the cause. Uh, so then, fast forward a couple weeks later, the town's erected a statue because the Giant saved them, or whatever. Like, uh, Hogarth, uh, he was a bullied kid. I, I feel like I've missed a lot. Uh, cause I, th this is all set during, like, the Cold War era, too, and it's just, like, all these poli- uh, like, there's all these political undertones throughout the whole thing, and it's just, like, it's insane. So, yeah, the, the Erecta statue, uh, Jeff Goldblum ends up banging Hogarth's mom, uh, Hogarth has friends now, even though he's, like, bullied throughout the whole thing. He's a fucking loser. Now he's got friends that play football. I'm like, okay, sure. Didn't develop any of this, but fine. Uh, and then, the on one night, the Hogarth has a little piece of the Iron Giant left, and it starts to move. And Hogarth's like, huh? And the, the screw's tapping on the window. He's trying to get the fuck out. And Hogarth's like, hmm, the Iron Giant may be trying to rebuild his giant irons. So... The screw leaves, and you cut to Antarctica, and you see the Iron Giant's head is, like, closed, and then his eyes, like, open, and, and it just cuts to black, leaving room, open, open room for a sequel, but 22 years later, and not shit has happened, except Ready Player One, and I hate that. Yeah, that's, uh, I, like I said, I haven't seen the movie in like four years. I'm pretty sure I described it accurately. There's a bunch I missed, probably. I tried, ladies and gentlemen. I tried. That guy's a fucking fanboy. Yeah, look who's talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's it. That's the reaction. <laughs> yep, that's it. I, honestly, we don't have to talk about this anymore. This has been broken down so much. I got some thoughts, though. I got some thoughts. So, yes. um, this movie, uh, like, I always put it in the same category with, like, Treasure Planet and Atlantis for several that's reasons. No, <laughs> I like Atlantis a lot, okay? And I like Treasure <laughs> Planet a lot, too. I can't say that this is better. <laughs> but, um... Uh, so it flopped in the box office in 1999 uh, just because oh, people were not so. yeah they were not necessarily interested it had the same the 2d 3d integrated animation uh, also I believe build in deep canvas just like treasure planet was and okay, some parts so of Atlantis so the iron so so anytime they had the iron giant that was 3d right yeah yeah okay that makes sense I was watching the film and I was like there's a contrast between the animations of Hogarth and the iron giant
that's mm -hmm. what it was. Right. Yeah, and like uh, there was a comment on it before saying that that actually made the Iron Giant feel a lot more otherworldly in a 2D world, and it also allowed to preserve a lot yeah. of proportion, which definitely helped the film. And like, I honestly am always been fascinated with like. Uh, the ways in which that is constructed and just crafted and we mm -hmm. need more movies like that like I honestly think that these movies have an insane potential for a comeback just because so many people right now in just general population have incredible memories of Treasure Planet and Iron Giant and Atlantis and movies like that and so like if somebody 2D animated Disney films and everything like that because yep. at this point people are kind of getting sick of 3D animated shit you know because it's so CG looking and now especially with the whole like the reboots of the like Lion King and shit like that, where that Facts. kind of animation style, like people, at least for me, I'm kind mm -hmm. of sick of that. I feel like there's so much more creation <laughs> when it comes to 2D animated stuff because you're actually like creating it with your own hands, you know? Like, the, and, Facts. And, and, and it feels more alive as well. Like, when I like, and don't get me wrong, like, I love Toy Story, right? I love mm -hmm. things like Toy Story, I love Pixar films in general, but I feel like when I see a 2D animated film like Iron Giant, where I see a 2D animated film like uh, Aladdin or Lion King or, you know, old school Lion King or any yeah. of that kind of stuff, <laughs> I feel like it's so much more like otherworldly and almost like, it's kind of weird to say, but it's almost like real, not realistic, but it, but it feels like I can feel it. You know what I'm saying? You're trying like, to say like, it's atmospheric. Yeah, like atmospheric. Like it's kind of like when, you know, like, it's kind of like practical effects versus VX, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? VX. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, honestly, this it's very, it's imaginative. And there is yeah. so much room these days for imagin imaginative ways to animate things. I mean, fucking think of Spider-Verse. Like, it's literally all yeah. that, you know? Spider-Verse is the exception because it's a fucking masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean. I'm casually jerking off Spider-Verse for the rest of the podcast. I mean, you've been working on that essay for how long? Yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, so uh, let's see. The, the film also seems to be a really, like, decent clash going on between it wanting to be a kid's movie and, like, something else as well. And I, I can, like, totally see Brad Bird's hand on it. It's one of his earlier pieces before he started working on Incredibles. Incredibles or any of the other stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I'm just imagining, you know, Edna walking across the animation <laughs> room go like, Darling, we need this to happen faster. Come on. And call me back. I enjoy our visits. Like, this, you know, is, just... Isn't this kind of crazy? Because, like, it's a flop. Everyone knows him for, like, Incredibles. And don't get me wrong. The Incredibles is a masterpiece. It's like... Mm-hmm. It's basically my favorite Pixar film, but Iron Giant is so goddamn underrated, and it like no one talks. And like it's like right up there with The Incredibles. In my yep. Opinion. Like it's such a good film. Like everyone's like, "Oh, The Incredibles." I'm like, y'all don't know this fucking masterpiece. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, but if if you if you think about it, the two movies are actually so different in in the ways in, in which it like f works with the viewer. Because like oh, Incredibles is action packed and it never stops the entire movie. I remember watching it last time and it was just like. Incredibles never stop. There's always something else happening, something else that just pulls you in. Some kind of action piece or a new stakes. Iron Giant is a lot more subtle than that. There's just kind of things happening really nice and almost draggy, but not really. Like, you know, that whole deer moment and the whole bonding between the boy and the giant. Like, all of those things, they're not necessarily the same type of genre that The Incredibles is trying to be. And the driving yeah. force of the film is the bond between those guys and, like, really nothing else. I mean, yeah, there's the army and everything, but it's really all about them getting to know each other and it's the giant's kind of arc of, of realizing that he's not a weapon in that sense. Uh, yeah. Which it, is pretty cool. Yeah, and, it, and it's really good because uh, you have these characters, and it, and I would say, I actually would, I mean, I know Holgarth is kind of like the main character technically, but I would actually mm -hmm. say that the Iron Giant is more so the main character. I think it's more of his story than Hogarth. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, I like Hogarth, right? Like, he's a good mm -hmm. character. And he's also like a very active character too, like like that he helps drive the story. Oh, he's an extremely out. active protagonist. And he does take, yeah, he's a very active protagonist. I actually like that because a lot of like kids in animated films, sometimes like they they either sometimes aren't or they are, but it's really annoying. But he has like a really good contrast of being like mm -hmm. he feels realistic. Like oh, of course this is a kid, and like if I was a kid, I would do that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. He feels like very 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 realistic. But I would say that uh, characters that are uh, 
extremely set like Dean McCopin and Kent Mansley help with the Iron Giant story as well. Because while Facts. he's kind of still trying to figure out the duality of his self, you have these characters like Dean and uh, Kent Mansley, and they've kind of already figured out who they are in a way. Mm -hmm. And it's all about comparing and contrasting those two and all the other stuff that we're going to get to later on once I talk about themes and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it, it really helps like drive the Iron Giant story pretty hard because in, in a lot of ways, like you want, like obviously in screenwriting, you learn that you want characters to go through a character arc. And I feel like Kent Mansley and I feel like Dean McCopin do go through a character arc, same with Hogarth and all that kind of stuff. But I also feel like it's kind of a good thing that they are like very knowing people, or at least Dean is a very knowing person and Kent's more knowing in who he is because mm -hmm. it helps with the Iron Giant who's trying to figure out literally who he is and also where the fuck he is, you know what I'm saying? Yep, yep. And all that kind of stuff. Um, really, really well. I, I just think it's a it's a cool thing having characters that know what's happening versus mm -hmm. characters that don't know what's happening. Like Yeah, and it's a, it's, it's a very it's big theme. Thing. It's a very mm hmm What were you guessing? Mm -hmm. Oh no no, go on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a really big theme of uh, identity and duality in, in all of that because every character except for Hogar pretty much has two kind of sides to them the aggressive part kind of like fight or flight instinct or a desire to communicate and learn and they're both kind of you know it's, it's a balancing act for everyone and mm -hmm. while some characters they kind of demonstrate this human's ability to just destroy and annihilate and you know hate things that they don't understand and and try to kind of protect and serve almost in in, in that specific context um and you know again being kind of misguided by this the violence that takes over one's sanity once they're so scared enough of something. And then there's characters that will try to be compassionate at all costs, hence Hogarth. Like, he's kind of the only character like that that does it. Maybe his mom as well, but she was a little underdeveloped in the film, so we can't really use her as an example. But, like, yeah, like, Hogarth is kind of this ultimate force of compassion that we're being uh, given. And in the world where he exists, right, he would kind of be the only person, the only character who is capable of that because everyone else is already existing in this system uh, of social kind of fear of the unknown. And because he's a kid, he doesn't necessarily get it. You know, he sees the Iron Giant, he's like, so cool! Like, anyone else would call <laughs> tanks, just like everyone, you know, like everybody Basically else in the film would. He does, yeah. <laughs> yep. but, uh, but, but the thing that's so cool about it is you have characters like Hogarth, like Ken, like Dean, who are trying to figure out, like, what the Iron Giant is in a way. Not, not so much Hogarth, because Hogarth is more so trying to teach him. But then you have yeah. the Iron Giant also trying to figure out who he is. Like, that's such a mm -hmm. smart thing. Like, like that's so cool, because it's like you're having these characters who don't know what this specific thing is, and then you have that thing doesn't even know what he is. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a movie about self-discovery, the one, one self-concept. And I guess we can kind of... Did we could we could dip into themes, right? Like we could start. I mean, dipping into time themes. as good as any. Yeah, I I feel like the uh, the the overarching theme of this movie is nature versus nurture. Mm hmm. Yeah, and I think when when you talk about uh like like the Iron Giant's nature, right? And it's mm -hmm. nature. In my opinion, they didn't outwardly say it in the film, but my guess is the Iron Giant came here to take over the fucking world. And well, yeah, it's a it's a machine of destruction. That's pretty obvious, I think, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be said, like which I also like. It didn't give this whole like it's from this planet and blah blah blah. Yeah, like, yeah, we yeah. Really know where it's from, but I think we can all agree that's where it's from. So you have the Iron Giant's nature contrasting with the nurture of humanity and 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 the nurture that Hogarth gives it, and it's mm -hmm. this like conflicting thing where it's try it's learning the nurture like with Superman versus Atomo, right? And I actually mm -hmm. think that's it's such a cool thing that they use Superman as like this big theme in this movie because Superman's story is also nature versus nurture in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about yeah. like him utilizing his Kryptonian nature, but his nurture that he got from his Earthling parents in order to become the best kind of superhero that he can be. That's what I think the point of Superman is. Now, they haven't exactly mm -hmm. shown that in films, but maybe <laughs> I'll make a Superman film one day. 
<clears throat> Maybe someday but, they uh, would. <laughs> but, uh, but, but that's what I think. And I think it's a cool thing that they used Superman in order to really show off that kind of, to show off that plot point. You know what I'm yeah. saying? But then in contrast, you have Atomo, who, uh, I don't really know. I don't know. Is Atomo actually a comic book character? I'm not too sure. I, I, I bet. I mean, yeah, the name kind of sure speaks it for itself. Be, yeah, I know Adam, man, and Adam and all that, but I don't know about Atomo. But let's just yeah. take what the movie says, for example. Atomo is like this bad person, and it kill, you know, they kill people. You know, Atomo kills people, and you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, he's utilizing his like nature in order mm -hmm. to oppress people and to kill people and all that kind of stuff. But you also know who does that as well. Mm. Kent Mansley. Kent oh. Mansley utilizes his nature as oh. a government official in order to abuse his power and get what he wants. Dude, I have so, so many. <laughs> I have so many. To understand the genius of this film now, right? It's so I, fucking good. Oh, I, I have so many <laughs> thoughts about his character altogether. It was yeah. so weird because. And to me, also, like, in the context of the movie, right, he's the yeah. agent of the government. And uh -huh. with the way film positions that, right, government is like this ultimate power that doesn't just dictate the rules of the world we live in, it, like, dictates yeah. every single person's choices that they make on a yeah. daily basis. And, mm -hmm. you know, he's the literal representation of this force, and he acts like he can do anything for the cause that he's kind of working towards. Like, exactly. he, he crashes at his house like at the bedroom kind of living with his mother in that case <laughs> so yeah. nonchalantly just because like he needs it so he you know commissions it because because why wouldn't he and why wouldn't they let him do it type thing and just thinking about it in that way right he also has his power and what you know whatever uh institutional kind of thing is, is telling him hey this is what we need to do this is how you need to do it and these are kind of the protocols you need to follow nothing is going to stop him and when i think of him i think of like other very similar characters like him that just carry that power of an institution with them along with this all the fucked up social constructs that they have to talk about um mm -hmm. thinking of um the uh the agent the, the the main antagonist of shape of water is definitely definitely like that um, and I mean, uh, fucking Gaston from uh, uh, Beauty and the Beast is literally <laughs> like that. Like you know, yeah. and and it's it, it's so interesting because and it's these characters that that know that they have this advantage in the nature that they have, but they abuse it. I mean, I know you're probably about to you're gonna laugh when I say this, but also mm -hmm. Vegeta in Dragon Ball as well. Like <laughs> he all constantly talks about how he's like this. He's I know, <laughs> you're laughing. He's yeah. this elite warrior, and he's a Saiyan, and no one else is better, and all that kind of shit. But, you know, eventually, like, he gets killed for his ego, he gets beaten up, and shit like that. And yeah. it, it's these characters, like, it's even, it's in the fucking dialogue. The first mm -hmm. thing that he says to Hogarth and all of that is like, Hi, I'm Kent Mansley. I work for the government. He doesn't mm -hmm. introduce himself like a human being. He doesn't say, hey, hello, how are you doing there, folks? My name's Ken Mansley. Yep. You know, all that. It's his robot. It's 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 funny because in a way, it's like this iron giant from space made of metal is more human than Ken Mansley, right? Yeah. Like, like the iron giant, the way he introduces himself is so much more human. Like he's figuring out Hogarth. Just like. He's dialoguing with him, speaking, pointing. all that kind of stuff. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pointing all of that, and Ken Mansley comes in just completely robotic, like, I'm Ken Mansley. I work for the government. And they even make fun of that because then once he goes back to Hobart's house, Hobart opens the door and says the exact same thing, like, You're Ken Mansley. You work for the government. So the film is trying to show you that through dialogue, which I think yeah. is just beautiful. Which also kind of demonstrates that that he's clearly afraid of him in that context because he now yeah. understands, you know, the whole giant thing. But yeah, yeah. do carry on. Mm -hmm. So, so Kent Mansley is a, you know, like he might seem like super generic bad guy, but I actually think what he represents in the film is fucking good. So, mm -hmm. you know, done with yeah, that. It's... Now let's move on to. Oh yeah, sorry. Go on. Yeah, I, I'm really just like uh, fascinated by the fact that when we first see him, uh, the, the, uh, when we see Mansley for the first time, 
we almost feel compassion towards him because we are just as thrown off by the giant's existence as he is. But so quickly in a movie, we just start hating the guy because of how, you know, how, how flat he is he's, he's in, in his goals. Yeah, he's a redhead, you know, like, <laughs> you know, he, he, he just kind of follows orders, yeah. you know, and uh, men like this are dangerous and reckless because they would refuse to do literally what Hogarth is doing the entire movie. Which is, you know, trying yeah. to communicate and understand something that is bigger than him that he doesn't get. Instead of just using blunt force and thinking that this is actually going to help. You know, and that's kind yeah. of the, how the movie ends anyways, right? They're trying to blast it with all they can. And I also really love that moment where they realize that uh, the battle mode is just a self-defense mechanism, right? So, like, he follows what attacks him because that's in his nature. But, you know... What other nature it's in? It's in human nature too. We do the same exact thing. We oh blow God. shit up when it attacks Eagle. us. Eagle, yes. I figured it out. I figured what? it out. What? Kent Mansley and the Iron Giant are the same fucking person. Think about it like this. The entire reason Kent Mansley came to Maine is to figure out what this Iron Giant thing is, right? Okay, yeah. As, but the way he explains it and the way the government explains it is they're doing it as a defensive sort of thing. Right? Uh -huh. like, oh, we're protecting America. We're <gasps> defending America. The Iron Giant only attacks when he defends. Meaning that where the alien planet he came from, he must have gone to Earth to see if the Earthlings are a threat. But he learned that they're good. It has to be that. It has to be that. Wait, wait, it has wait. To be that evil. No, wait. That that, 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 be there's a flaw. There's a flaw in that. For How two, two reasons. This is perfect. So two, no, no, no. If, if he was supposed to learn if they're a threat or not, one yeah. human being that he made friends with would constitute yeah. basically tanks and fucking nukes that they throw at him? Like, I mean, you're like, saying yeah, that okay, bond but... with one person is kind of trumps everything else that they did to him? Well, remember, he took the blow to the head, right? So he might not typically, like, remember, remember what he was supposed well, to do. Well, here's, right? here's my line of thinking here, right? Because, yeah. uh, and this kind of has to, more to do with the concept art of the movie, because, you know, it... it didn't really bother explaining us where our engine is from because it's not about that. But yeah, from what we, yeah, yeah. But from what we see from that flashback that the giant has when he is having that dream of you know other machines like himself destroying shit, like um, in there he was a part of a kind of a bigger assault team essentially that was destroying stuff. So it seems like the Iron Giants, uh, plural, kind of come in as an army to exterminate a planet. And he kind of broke away from that, and for some unknown reasons, he's no longer a part of that. And he sees those dreams, but you know, yeah, like, like my speculation would be that he still has all the basic cognitive processing in his head, but his memory is so damaged that he completely lost this, like, previously known reason as to why he would be destroying worlds and shit like that. So now he's just trying to figure out what is what and whether or not it's even worth destroying. And because just because Hogarth was like the first person he met, right, and tried to interact with that wasn't actually hostile, that allowed the Iron Giant to just like not be a power of destruction anymore. But that's a speculation because the movie really, like a movie does such a good job withholding that information the only reason we see that flashback in the dream of the iron giant is just to foreshadow the the berserker mode <laughs> you know when, when he tries to destroy shit and that works perfectly in the context of the plot and it's not trying to reveal too much so that this gives us room to speculate and that's what makes this movie so fucking good you know yeah, like a lack of information triggers our imagination and as a yeah. kid, as a little kid, I fucking loved that to every single bit. Just because, yeah. you know, my brain wouldn't it's, stop. <laughs> uh, yeah, and as someone like me who's a fucking nerd, I think I'm like, oh my god, were they like the Viltrumites? Were they like the Saiyans? You know, <laughs> it triggers all my memories. Like, what, 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 what was this thing? Where does it come from? How, what can I compare it to? What kind of fiction, other fiction can I compare it to? Um, let's talk about Dean McCopin or yeah, yeah, what about... I think he also plays, like, a really important role in the film. Absolutely. So, like, you know, on the fly, like, you're like I know, like, typical casual moviegoers might be like, oh, well, he's the cool guy that, that kind of just <laughs> teaches you about things and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, Rob, yeah, yeah. is that... One... Did you see... Remember the yin-yang robe that he wore? I didn't fucking yeah. realize that until my last yeah. watch. Yeah. <sighs> 
I Yo, was the duality! Like, yeah, exactly, Ooh. duality. I just saw, I was like, oh my god, he's wearing a yin-yang robe. That's fucking perfect, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then this is, but this is another thing that's cool. So, his job, how mm -hmm. he works in a junkyard, he works in this junkyard, right? And all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. His own job, what his job is, represents the plot of this movie. So mm -hmm. he's he's being brought in and he's taking in all this you know, this this junk, right? And this metal, it's destroyed, it's you know rusting and all that kind of stuff. It's very very ugly. But then what he does is he makes it into art. He makes it something beautiful, right? And he has this quote. He says what he says to um. He says to uh, uh, he says to Hogarth like, "You are who you choose to be." Mm -hmm. And he he's taking this art, which is pre uh, predestined to be like ugly and all that kind of stuff in yeah. his junkyard, and he uh, this this metal he you know all of that, and he changes it into art. He makes it something yeah. beautiful. He's choosing to make it something beautiful. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? And use his rose rose colored glasses in order. He has like you know like I'd say that. Uh, sorry, I, I'm not. And he has like this, he has this perspective, this very like rose colored glasses kind of perspective because he's choosing to see this metal as something beautiful and mm -hmm. um, and not see the ugliness in it, just like the Iron Giant as well. How Hogarth is choosing to see this piece of fucking metal and he's choosing to see it as something beautiful. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I just think that's like a really, really, really like cool. I mean, it, it yeah. also becomes more literal when a giant literally starts to pose as one of his sculptures to yeah, to hide himself. Exactly. Yeah, no facts. Yeah. And, and like he starts creating art of his own. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I, I actually like uh the way his character is positioned on the spectrum that the movie shows us. Like Mansley mm -hmm. is on one end of the extreme that is not moving at all. And then you have Hogarth who's like the most flexible, who just has that compassion and empathy, who wants to learn and understand. And then he's kinda smacked in the middle, right? Where he is cooperative with the existing system and order, but at the same time he's open to interpretations of things because he's an artist. And he's yeah, able exactly. to like look into it's like why is Hogarth doing Doing the stupid shit that he does like he's not just a kid in his eyes he was at some point but like no yeah. no longer is because um he can't help but resonate with how hogarth is feeling because he's seen what hogarth has seen and he is open to seeing it too like you know if mansley saw it he wouldn't react at all he wouldn't change but he did and yeah that he, he's just a really awesome character and, and a role model for someone who if already existing in the system is still able to adapt and do what is right, you know, instead yeah. of necessarily just following the rules. But yeah, he's yeah. a really awesome character. I like him he's a lot. A, and he's a great fucking character. Like, every uh, character I'm, is fucking great in this film. Just... Facts. I mean, there's a lot of them that are nice. I really wish the mom's character would be a little more developed, though, because she's lacking yeah. that sense of duality. She just kind of has care, you know? But Yeah, like, that um, is the one thing I was going to say, is that, um, and I like Hogarth, and I like the mom. Like, they're you know, the, mm -hmm. the dialogue's great and all of that. If this is a film of, like, duality, then I feel like it would have been interesting to see the dual sides of Hogarth and the dual sides of the mom as well. Yeah. Because we saw it, we see it with Bean and we see it with Kent Mansley. Because sometimes, like, you know, it, you think, like, oh, man, Kent really does seem like he cares about the country and all of that. But then towards the end of the film, you really see, like, the ugliness in him. Where he's Fact. Like, you know, the, the bomb's about to be dropped. Uh, dude, like, dude, wait. He's th like, th fuck that the government, like, I'm saving uh, myself, you know? Like, that like, whole moment, that whole moment, I just, like, that was my favorite moment in the whole movie, just because it has everything to do with the culture of, of the yeah. 50s. And I gotta say, Mansley's, like, entire moment there is kind of just goes to show how terrible of a human being he is. Because at some point he talks to the general, he's like, we can duck and cover, there's a shelter nearby. Like he's totally okay with that town being obliterated and irradiated. You have got to stop, general. Let's get it closer! Order! Watch the missile now! We can duck and cover. There's a fallout shelter right there's there. There's no hold him, man. Make sure he stays here. And, you know, like, fuck duck and cover. That's that's a false sense of safety. That's not how nukes work. And everyone knows that except for him. Because he's so driven with this destructive thing in his brain. Thinking about manifesting power and destroying things you hate. You know, the things that and you're it, afraid of. 
I, oh yeah. my god, you just gave me another revelation. And it, it, it's so, actually, let me finish uh, point about Manson. Yeah. Okay. It, it, it just goes to show, like, you know, how much of an ugly. It, it really shows that it's a commentary on the ugliness of, uh, you know, some of these, some of American culture. Mm -hmm. And it's very, like, you know, very, it, it's almost like critiquing individualism. Yeah, of course. What? Actually, that makes sense because the entire point of this film is about dualism. It's critiquing yeah. individualism. Yep. And also another thing too is that this film, from a superhero film standpoint, because I think it's a superhero film, because like I oh, it that. absolutely yes. is. You know, yeah. It's yeah. about how powers don't make the man. You are who you choose to be. It. You are the man. You. You choose to do what you do with your powers, and that's what makes you a hero. Mm -hmm. And they do that with Superman, right? You know, yeah. super Superman's powers don't make him Superman. Superman's mentality and the way he grew up and Mon Pa Kent, what they taught him, makes him Superman. Spider-Man's yep. powers don't make him Spider-Man. Great power comes great responsibility is <laughs> Spider-Man, right? <laughs> and just like with America, where it's almost critiquing America, it's almost poking fun at American culture in a way where it's like, hey, yeah. America... You having the nukes and all these weapons doesn't make you the savior of country, the most powerful country, and all of that. It's you yep. being a good, you know, it's the day of the point. I'm not going to get into politics, but it's yeah. basically saying that you treating people right and you being good and, and, and you protecting people and all that kind of stuff is what makes you America, your country, right? Yeah. And uh, now, whether, you know, America does this well sometimes that's another conversation <laughs> but i'm just saying that like i think in this film where it's it's trying to tell you like hey america like hey people of america you don't have to you having the nukes and being the world superpower doesn't have to make you special you make yeah. you special you know what i'm saying <laughs> you make you really, special yeah you make you special who you are is uh... what's going to make you special like that and that's what i think it's it's almost like Spider-Verse in a way, you know what I'm saying? Be yourself, yeah. all that kind of I, shit. Yeah. I, I get your point, I get your point perfectly. It's just, I'm thinking of America as we know it, and realizing oh, yeah. how yeah, fucking yeah, yeah. far it is from being well, anywhere near it. good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> as a I, whole. I, I get it, I, I, and I'm, saying, I'm not saying like America is perfect or anything like that, I'm just saying that like, you don't have to have a bully mentality, almost like Ken Mansley did say, I yeah. work for the government, and America be like, we have the nukes and all that kind of shit. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. That is not what makes you special. Being a good person is what's going to make you special in this world. You know what I'm using, saying? Using using that saying. power for, for good. the yeah. good reason and not the bad one, because mutually not, assured okay. destruction is not going to create peace, goddammit. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's it's just gonna it, make it worse. It's just gonna make it worse. Um, yeah. But so but you know what? Can, yeah, yeah. Sorry, the one thing about Mansley's character that I do think is worth noting, and that also kind of goes in the context of everything you describe about just like America being itself. Mm -hmm. um, for, for a hot second, uh, like when I first watched it, I watched it in kind of segments because I was like six, <laughs> and uh, I saw the the scene where um, Hogarth is talking with um, Mansley at his house, and there he's trying to talk about what to do with the giant and whatever, and um, th the way in which Hogarth disobeys what Mansley is telling him, it almost makes Mansley feel like a parental figure. He's kind of like his dad, and I, when I watched that segment for the first time out of context, I thought it was his dad. And just thinking about that too, like, the movie doesn't, doesn't just talk about how, you know, the establishment and power structure is bad. It talks about the fact that because Hogarth lives in that system, you know, in, in yeah. the society that he's in, um, he, it's hard to disobey those things. It's hard to disobey those orders because it's kind of like it's his dad basically telling him, don't do this, this is not how things are done. And Hogarth is like, but, but he's fun you know like like it's not you know it's just so interesting it's almost like a parental dis disobedience in that sense and it's just really interesting because in this context right he's just the establishment and yeah the whole notion of the bomb right like by the end uh i just wanted to kind of emphasize the fact that the movie assumes like that we assume along with the movie for the longest time that the iron giant sacrifices himself you know with the bomb and uh, before I saw the resurrection moment in the end, which was relieving when I was six and seven years old, 
but then it like totally didn't feel like it afterwards because I kind of wanted the giant to stay dead because of all the political connotation that the notion of the bomb gives us. It, it kind of makes seems it almost made it seem like the nukes that humans possess are like the ultimate power of destruction and it takes a, another super weapon to literally go consciously good and sacrifice itself to stop a nuke from blowing up and causing mass destruction in turn and it's yeah, just like, like you know i guess that is the one critique like it could have i i think the film could have ended maybe a bit stronger if mm -hmm. it just had that iron giant dead because it would have just shown like you know, dualism and and all of that, it, it, and and who you are is a very important mm -hmm. thing. And if you don't realize that and wake up like Ken Mansley, then <laughs> this could this could be your fate. You know what I'm are saying? Are you telling me that he is woke? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, okay. Well. I just wanted to point out that nukes fucking suck, and I don't think yeah, I've seen a movie that that would demonstrate it in a similar context, because he just yeah. says the bomb, you know, and it's like, it has gravity to that, the term, and, and uh, it could have been a lot more impactful if it actually killed the Iron Giant, because that would basically yeah. mean that, yeah, Iron Giant is evil, Iron Giant has this unstoppable power that can heal itself from any kind of damage, but humans have the ultimate evil that he will not recover from. Because human anger and fear of, of destruction and their desire to destroy is basically more powerful than a giant, because that's what the bomb symbolizes. And I don't know, that, that was a thing for me. That's a good yeah. one, but I also think what could be really good as well is that you see this weapon of destruction who had bad intentions coming here on Earth, becoming a good person and sacrificing himself for our uh, symbol of destruction. Therefore, we as a human beings need to change for the better. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, it, yep. it could have been that as well. Because if something else from another planet can do that, we can do that. That's yep. slightly more uplifting than what you were saying. <laughs> slightly. <laughs> um, the last yeah. point I wanted to make uh, I actually wanted to talk this we're gonna get super philosophical now so break out your textbooks boys and girls we're gonna talk about Plato so, and there will be a quiz on this in the end <laughs> so so uh, Plato talks about the idea of self right and mm -hmm. Plato's point of the idea of self is that like the spirit lives in the body and is an in intellectual entity that's like separate from its physical self right mm-hmm um, like it says here i'm reading plato has a I, i'm not looking this up but like to give you a better idea because i have my own lame in terms of it but let me just mm -hmm. the full thing. um basically uh writing in the western self this human self is fundamentally an intellectual entity whose true or central nature exists as separate from the physical world so that's basically what it is and i feel like that kind of captures the Iron Giant perfectly and the whole nature versus nurture thing that we've been talking about perfectly as well is like the Iron Giant is its own you are who you choose to be you are your own intellectual property that is different from your physical entity right because this physical entity of the Iron Giant is this very destructive being but his intellectual uh, self um, its own spiritual self is what he chooses to be what he yeah out what yeah. he chooses to be out rules what he was made to be so uh i mean it's fucking genius right yeah like, you mean you mean you basically the, this is one of the best films of all time is what i'm saying <laughs> yeah it's like the <laughs> it's the intention you were created with which is what you yeah. choose to do with your body and your being which is fucking exactly. awesome yeah um, yeah exactly like it's guys this is how good filmmaking is we're comparing it to fucking plato right <laughs> like, oh yeah this film's there's amazing. gems yeah. there's some philosophical gems in this and I guess yeah. my, my final point is very similar to that but uh, something that I honestly think every sci-fi film or story or a book just kind of has to it because you mm -hmm. know sci-fi since the beginning since like Isaac Asimov was writing the foundation series there was yeah. always room for philosophy and for just analysis of human behavior and things like that mm -hmm. you know individual and collective alike and mm -hmm. Something that I really like is that we can look at this film as Iron Giant being this template of an outside character that is being suddenly brought into the human world. And he gets introduced to the spectrum of what humans are capable of. 
And from there we learn, from the Iron Giant's perspective, is that humans are capable of in insane acts of compassion and curiosity and just like love and affection even though the the, the latter are, were not necessarily shown that much but the compassion that Hogarth has towards another sentient being that is an iron giant no matter how much bigger he is than him no matter how much you know weirder and scarier and intimidating the giant looks Hogarth still really just wants to figure out what's going on and you know talk and make friends and make small talk because uh, he's curious and and the compassion is just inherently there and nothing even fucking active war zone will stop Hogarth from trying to help him afterwards in fact this power of compassion and uh, the desire to just kind of communicate is what causes Iron Giant the inherently a machine of destruction to have a full turnaround and do something opposite which is technically sacrificing himself in the end to fight machines of destruction like himself, just created by a different race. And now on the other hand, right, like, he has shown this power of compassion a human's capable of, but we're also demonstrated the immense lengths humans are willing to go through for the sake of destruction. And even though they're posing it as self-defense, right, it's still an inherently human attribute, the idea of just destroying shit that you're not aware of and destroying things you don't fully understand blowing things up that feels threatening that you know before even talking or thinking we are really fucking shitty at communication especially when we're scared and like you know uh the the uh, protagonists and the main antagonists of iron giant are humans and i just love that the most and i think the uh if you really want to go into like this really kind of you know subliminal messaging or whatever the fuck uh, it's it's uh, Doctor Who went over this and a whole bunch of other sci-fi movies went through this but it's this idea of uh, society uh, is only as advanced uh, by definition as the value that it puts on the life of a single individual right and if you think about it right Mansley he uh, in the end he is okay with a town being blown up he's like almost okay with casualties uh, among civilians to happen in his attempt to destroy the giant and that goes to show how little value he gives to lives of these people and you know like that's just that's just it that's just the concept right and yeah we cannot be blinded by this shit it's in our nature just like iron giants right like he has the berserker mode that is a self-defense mechanism that is really powerful that allowed us humans to survive throughout evolution you know the anger the fury the destructive potential that we have as species however now we don't need it we don't have to do it there's always a better solution that is not violent yeah. god damn it and at the and honestly what it really is it's a time it's really mm -hmm. just having balance and who you are. You can have those things, you can have the flaws, you can have all the other stuff that makes you human and all that, but it's really about that, because like for me, so for me I know, I do m mixed martial arts, I do MMA, so things like violence, it's kind of just a part of my life, right? And I choose to do it as a, something positive, you know, where I try to learn discipline from it, uh, respect through my teachers and my coaches and all that kind of stuff and you know try to do it in a good way in a good setting instead of you know choosing to be bad about it and just you mm -hmm. know, fucking beat up random people and shit like that. <laughs> you know <laughs> you know so yep. it's all about having the balance in life you know I think it, owning both sides of who you are is, is a very important thing and honestly I don't think there's any film like this that shows that you know i, I don't yeah, think no. there's any film like this that literally shows that like this yeah. film's a fucking masterpiece and if you do think of a movie that does please write it in the comments yeah please <laughs> good stuff all right well I think that's pretty much it. There's so so many things. Just like every other yeah. movie we talk about, there's so many other things we that we don't, don't even this mention. Film for three more hours, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and most of the other movies we talked to as well. So please write mm -hmm. in the comments what other thoughts you had. Uh, yeah. Would love to respond. Would love to chat with you all. This is exciting because we're actually gaining some traction on YouTube these days. The the yeah. gods of the algorithms have been nice to us. So they're gonna be great to us. They're gonna be even better to us once that Spider Verse video drops. <laughs> 
Yeah, and be on the lookout if you want an Iron Giant reaction. We were thinking about doing it, maybe with John joining us for that. But Perhaps. let us know if you want that. We yeah. we can totally do that. All right. Thank you, everyone, for watching the video. Like and subscribe if you watched it. Let us know what you want us to talk about in the future. And we'll talk to you all later. Peace out.